Hi, I am Tulani Makhalanyane, and I am one of the editors at M Systems. I work at the University of Pretoria in South Africa, where my research focuses on microbiomes in ecologically extreme environments. Due to the complexity of host associated terrestrial and marine microbiomes, it is often very difficult to understand the precise functional contributions of bacteria, archaea, and viruses. The role of the environment is known to substantially influence microbial communities and in turn, microbial interactions may have indirect feedbacks on the environment. To decipher the relationship between and among microbial communities with the environment requires an ecological view which combines systems thinking, synthesis, and modeling. As part of the M systems thinking series, we will hear from three leading experts applying microbial systems ecology in their research. Our three guests, Rebecca Thurber, Thomas Bell, and Samuel Chefouan, will share some of their research focused on systems ecology. From the mechanisms behind microbially sourced carbon export in the ocean to experimental manipulation of interacting bacteria to unveil their mechanisms of interactions, this session aims to inspire a paradigm shift regarding our view of microbes as core constituents of complex ecological systems. So please remember to stay for a chance to meet the speakers face to face and ask some of your questions. This is a great opportunity to interact with the leading minds on systems ecology. So please stick around and introduce yourself. I hope you enjoy this session. Good morning. Uh, thanks again for coming to this uh, M Systems Thinking Series session on systems microbiology. Uh, the first speaker for the session is going to be Professor Thomas Bell. He's a professor of microbial ecology at Imperial College in London. Um, and his uh, areas of, uh, of research include biodiversity and ecosystem functioning in bacterial communities, spatial patterns um, of these assemblages, um, and also predator-prey relationships between microbial groups. And uh, today he's uh, going to be talking to us about his rec recent work on how to combine top-down and bottom-up approaches to microbial systems ecology. I hope you enjoyed the talk. So thank you, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to this symposium. Uh, and thank you to the, the Natural Environment Research Council, the Royal Society, and the European Research Council for funding the research that I'll be talking about. Uh, I'm really interested in the ecology of microbial communities. Uh, as I'm sure all of you appreciate, microbial communities are incredibly complex. And one of the main challenges is to try to understand the factors that structure these communities. And for much of my past research, what I've taken is what I, the, the approach that I've taken is an approach that I think of as, as the classical ec approach in ecology, which is to use uh, information that I've gathered from the literature, from past experience and so forth, to formulate a set of hypotheses uh, and then to conduct experiments or make observations uh, that allow me to test those hypotheses. So here is an experiment that we set up in ponds uh, where we uh, filled some plastic tubs with water. Uh, we applied different treatments to those ponds uh, in order to, to test the hypothesis that we had generated. We come back a while later and we look at what's in those communities to see whether the treatments have, an, have had an impact. So when we sample the communities, uh, we characterize the microbial communities that are found within those, uh, each of these ponds, and we look to see whether there's a significant relationship between the treatment that we've applied and the communities that we've observed. 
Of course, there are lots of different ways of, um, uh, of, of visualizing and testing these hypotheses. Uh, often we'll construct an ordination of the communities where each of the communities here is, uh, is one of these data points. Uh, uh, data points that are further apart are communities that are more uh, um, uh, uh, are distinct communities. Uh, a community of data points that are further apart have more different communities. And we can look to see whether um, um, communities that are from different treatments have more dissimilar communities, which allows us to test the hypothesis uh, of, of whether the treatments are having an impact on those communities. So this is what I think of as a top-down empirical approach. We come up with a hypothesis and then we test that hypothesis um, uh, to see whether the, the treatments are having an impact. There's an alternative approach that I wanted to discuss today, uh, which is what I think of as a, a bottom-up approach. And this is to forget about hypotheses and to just look at the communities as they appear. So we've removed any sense of what the treatments were uh, uh, or, uh, or any other environmental factors that might be impacting those communities. And we just look at how these communities scatter themselves across ordination space. Now these are just black and white communities um, and we can apply uh, any one of a number of algorithms to look for clusters of communities within this ordination space. Uh, we can apply that, those sorts of algorithms. Perhaps we identify three uh, distinct clusters of communities and we can then go about trying to explain those clusters of communities in terms of the environmental factors that may or may not have been applied to them. So this is quite a different approach, is a bottom-up approach where we don't start with the hypothesis, we start with the communities and then try to explain the clustering that we observe in those communities. Of course, we don't need to look at this from a, uh, from a whole community perspective. We can also look at the individual taxa that make up these communities. Uh, so starting again from the community matrix, we can look at look for positive or negative uh, correlations in the abundance of the species that are found in those communities, use that to construct a network of associations. And once we've constructed the, that association network, we can look for sets of species that associate in similar ways in order to identify functional uh, groups or ecological guilds. Um, and uh, uh, use that then to formulate hypotheses about which uh, functional groups or guilds may be important under different circumstances. So again, a bottom-up approach, which starts from the communities themselves and uses patterns in those communities uh, to construct hypotheses at the end of the day. So this is the kind of approach that we've used uh, uh, over the past several years. Uh, and we've used primarily a model system uh, uh, which are these uh, uh, pools of rainwater. So this is a, a beech tree, uh, quite a large tree. Uh, you can see that uh, um, because beech trees are relatively shallow rooting, they tend to be found in sandy soils. And so they get this buttressing at the base of the tree. Uh, and it also has this relatively smooth bark. And so when it rains, uh, then the rain comes down the trunk of the tree and gets deposited within the buttressing at the base to form these pools of water. Uh, these are like miniature ponds. Many of them are ephemeral, uh, but some of them can be found year round. Uh, and we use these as replicated natural ecosystems, uh, which can be used to, to test ideas in microbial ecology. Uh, we conducted a, a survey of, uh, several years ago now, it's con conducted by Dave, Damien Rivet, who is a postdoc in my lab, who's now at Manchester Metropolitan University where he visited sites across the south of the UK and collected samples from about 750 of these water-filled tree holes. Um, so the, the workflow that we followed was to go out, we sampled the tree holes, we collected the communities. Um, these communities were then put into a, a common environment, which was a media that was um, made from the leaves of beech trees. They were grown up and then they were frozen to create a living archive. And we sequenced the communities for their bacterial composition using 16S amplicon sequencing. Uh, and uh, Alberto uh, was also a postdoc in my lab, now at ETA Zurich, 
looked at ordinations of those communities. So here is an ordination of all 750 communities. Each of the dots here is an individual communities, community, and he used an algorithm in order to detect clusters within this ordination space. The optimal number of clusters was six different clusters. This is uh, showing the first two principal coordinates. You can see that some of these clusters lie on top of each other, but in other dimensions, they don't lie on top of each other. Um, so you do indeed get uh, six distinct clusters, which are character, uh, which we can, we can look at uh, the, the characteristic taxa that are found within each of those clusters. And you can see that the different community classes, the different clusters are characterized by different compositions where we have different individual taxa that are dominating each of the community classes. So here's that bottom up approach where we have simply conducted a survey. We've clustered, we've um, conducted an ordination of the communities. We've identified clusters of similar communities and we've characterized what those communities look like. Of course, now the, the question is whether those clusters have any ecological significance. And we can look at this partly by continuing along the molecular biology route. Uh, we didn't have the funds to uh, construct 750 metagenomes, but of course we could impute the metagenomes uh, using one of several algorithms. I think here we used uh, uh, an algorithm called PyCrust. Uh, and uh, that allowed us to construct metagenomes from the 16S libraries. Uh, on the left here, we have an ordination of the metagenomes. And you can see that you get, uh, each of the colors here are the community classes. And as we get clusters for the 16S data, we also get clustering for the imputed metagenome data. Um, so it shows that not only do we get di uh, distinct taxonomic compositions, we also get distinct um, uh, 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 genetic, we also get distinct genetic compositions as well. We can categorize the genes according to different keg pathways. Um, uh, this is just looking at pairwise comparisons of different classes of genes which are found within the metagenomes and identify uh, the primary ways by which these community classes differ. So this is comparing uh, community class one and two, um, which are communities which are dominated by Pseudomonas putida or Klebsiella pneumonia. Uh, and you can see that they have overexpression or underexpression of certain community classes, um, uh, uh, which lends to the idea that these are not just taxonomically different groups, they're also functionally different as communities. Uh, but because we've gone and we've actually frozen the communities, we don't need to stop there. We don't need to show just, we're able to show not just that these community classes have different functional capacities, that they have the, the metabolic pathways to undertake different functions. We can also conduct assays with those frozen communities. So we went back into the frozen archives. We revived all 750 of those communities. Because we had sequenced those communities as they went into the freezer and as they came out of the freezer, we knew the starting point for those communities. And so we could then correlate whether or not differences in those communities were associated with um, a, 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 a different functional capacities for those communities. Uh, the assays that we performed were looking at their capacity to degrade different kinds of substrates. Um, so to degrade um, cellulose, monoesters, chitin, and hemicellulose. Uh, and what we have here is a heat map of um, the, pro the propensity for each of those community classes to degrade these different sorts of substrates. And you can see that uh, some community classes, so commun notably community class number one was very efficient at degrading these substrates, had the highest rates of degradation relative to the other community classes. Some community classes were very, very poor at degrading those substrates, and some were good at degrading some and poor, uh, sorry, good at degrading some and poor at degrading others. So we see that these are these community classes, it's not just that there are clusters in, in community space, but they have ecological and functional significance. We've identified not just that they're taxonomically distinct, 
but that there are repercussions for that taxonomic distinctness. It's not just that we're identifying different redundant sets of species, it's that those different taxonomic compositions have significance in terms of the functioning of these ecosystems. We did something similar uh, using the same kind of bottom-up approach where we looked at uh, association networks within the 750, 750 communities. Uh, this is what the association network looked like where we have negative association. So each of the nodes here is a different species. Each of the links shows a, a positive, uh, uh, excuse me, a positive or a negative association. And uh, what Alberto did is he created an, an algorithm to identify sets of, uh, of, uh, uh, sets of taxa which had similar um, patterns of association. And those sets of taxa uh, are colored differently here. So blue colorations indicate a set of taxa which have uh, similar associations with other taxa within those communities. Um, that allowed us to identify these functional groups, and we could then identify whether those functional groups are, again, have ecological significance. Um, we did this by taking the communities out of the freezer and conducting a series of invasion assays. So this was these were experiments conducted by Matt Jones, who's now at the University of Exeter. The cryopreserved communities were taken out of the freezer, inoculated into microcosms, uh, allowed to grow up, and then we in, added a couple of uh, different invaders, two species of pseudomonas, pseudomonas, which had been marked using uh, a luminescent marker so that we could track its abundance over time. We put them in at relatively high densities, and then we looked at its survival rate within the microcosms. Each of the dots here is an individual microcosm containing one of those 750 communities. And you can see that there is on average a decline in the abundance both of Pseudomonas fluorescens and Pseudomonas putida, with a few of the communities increasing in abundance up to around 10 to the cell, seven cells per mil. Um, and I guess the main finding from this was that we can actually, some of the most significant associations uh, in terms of the, uh, in, when we were looking for associations between invaders survival and the composition of those communities, had to do with the functional groupings that we had identified within these association networks. If we looked at, at whether invader survival was related to the diversity of the communities in which they are found, uh, in terms of the taxonomic diversity or the phylogenetic diversity, we only found quite weak effects. Whereas when we looked at uh, whether the survival of these invaders was associated with the different functional groupings that we found within those communities, and we found very significant associations, particularly with one functional group, functional group four, which of course raises the question of what is it that functional group four is doing in order to, uh, in order to affect the survival of these new strains that are coming into the communities. So this kind of approach, this bottom-up ecology of, of microbes, I think is a really useful approach, a really useful complement to the top-down approach, where the starting point is to identify community classes, functional group, guilds, keystone taxa, and the like, and then to determine whether they're ecologically meaningful in some way, uh, whether they're important for determining the abundance of invaders, the functioning of those ecosystems and so forth, allowing us to generate new hypotheses about key environmental variables. And I think the second major point is the utility of this approach of um, sampling communities and constructing an archive of the, uh, of the communities themselves that we can resuscitate so that we can do repeated experiments with the same starting material. If we also know the membership of those communities, then that gives us a very powerful tool for conducting uh, replicated ecology with microbial communities, allowing us to identify functionally and ecologically important community classes and functional groups. Thank you very much. I am delighted to introduce Samuel Shafwa. Samuel is a computational biologist and microbiologist at CNRS in France. Samuel was previously a postdoctoral fellow at the VIB in Belgium. 
His main research interest lies in understanding natural microbial communities and their structures at different levels of organization, from genes to communities to ecosystems. This research spans across various habitats, including the human intestinal tract, but also the world's oceans. He develops comparative and functional metagenomic approaches to reveal universal patterns conserved across the microbial tree of life, as well as systems ecology approaches to understand natural community assembly rules at the functional level. He has developed several computational models and algorithms to gain a predictive understanding of microbial community function. These tools have helped to reveal microbial dynamics in natural ecosystems and facilitated a mechanistic understanding of species interactions and ecosystem functions. Samuel has the ability to simplify complex ecological theory, so I certainly hope you enjoy his talk. Hi everyone. Um, so today, uh, well, first I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this uh, M Systems webinar. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and today I'll present you some recent work um, uh, we did um, in Nantes, uh, where we are very interested in uh, using community network models uh, to study plankton ecosystems and um, study the systems ecology of, of planktonic uh, ecosystems. So uh, first, briefly, uh, what is systems ecology? So um, I think it can be defined as um, the holistic study of uh, any ecological systems. Uh, and that means trying to integrate as much as we can uh, the biotic, but also the abiotic components of these ecosystems. And very importantly, also try to integrate the interaction aspect, how these um, systems interact uh, with each other. And I think that's very important because some um, emerging uh, properties, some properties, specific properties can emerge from these uh, interactions at different scales of, of the ecosystems. Um, so in the group, we are very interested uh, in uh, instilling interactions at the microbial uh, scale uh, and uh, also trying to understand uh, how these interactions may be impacted uh, by environmental forcings uh, and in particular by human activities. <clears throat> and this is very, uh, very uh, important because we know well today that these uh, microbial activities uh, and their interaction as well are very important in balancing earth uh, ecosystems, uh, notably through primary production, through the photosynthesis in the ocean, uh, for example, through nutrient cycling, nitrogen fixation, so many processes uh, that uh, are key to uh, the, the health of our planet, basically. Um, and these, uh, we also know that these biotic interactions uh, can actually influence the, the distribution, the biogeography of these species, uh, but also influence their evolution. And I think that's the, 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 the real challenge today, trying to understand um, how these microbial systems uh, organize uh, themselves across these different scales from biomolecules to uh, gene species communities up to, uh, to large biomes, large ecosystems. So uh, very brief, briefly, the basics of these uh, community networks, uh, models or co-occurrence networks, we often call them co-occurrence networks. Um, usually how we do uh, is simply, uh, we start from um, an incidence matrix or an abundance matrix, and we try to detect a significant association uh, or co-presence between taxa um, species, uh, which we have uh, measured uh, across sampling location or time. Um, and we use, well, uh, statistical tools or, um, uh, probabilistic uh, models to, to detect this specific association or mutual exclusion between, uh, between taxa. Uh, and 
usually we uh, we interpret a co-presence as uh, as niche overlap, uh, so two organisms sharing the same uh, environment to grow, or as a potential mutualism or commensalism uh, relationship. And when we detect a mutual exclusion, so that is to say a, a negative association between two clades, two or two groups, two taxa, then we interpret it as a, a distinct niche preference or a competition or a, even a mensalism. Um, so, and these community networks are actually very useful uh, abstractions. They are, they are abstractions to, to model the, the, the complex structure of uh, microbial interactions. And um, usually these are just uh, proxies to, uh, to, to model the, these, these interactions because they are very difficult to validate. And uh, today the existing tools to infer these networks um, uh, always predict a lot of uh, uh, false positive and, uh, but also true negative. So a real challenge today is to try to validate this interaction, uh, but that's not what I'm gonna discuss today. That's the data. Um, so we, we focused in this study on uh, two specific marker genes, the 16S marker genes and the 18S marker genes, so 16S to, to survey uh, prokaryotes and eukaryotes, and the 18S marker genes to survey uh, protists and eukaryotes. And we have that data, uh, well, we, we inferred abundance um, uh, matrices from this for, for these different markers across different size fraction. Uh, which we had sampled from pole to pole. So what you see here are the different sampling station we, uh, where we collected um, uh, plankton samples uh, in, uh, during our, our expeditions. And so the first challenge was actually to integrate these different data because we had uh, uh, information from five different um, organism size fractions for these two marker genes. And we had to integrate that um, uh, in the, 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 the process well, in the process of inferring this global network. Uh, we had to do this um, size fraction uh, wide because we could not directly compare this size fraction due to the compositional nature of, the, of this uh, omics, uh, omics data. So we designed a, a specific approach to detect uh, first intralayer association um, and interlayer association across uh, well, so within and across the size fraction to build a global um, uh, network graph of predicted um, direct association within and across the size fractions. So this approach, um, in this approach, we use the flash with um, flash with tool, which is very uh, interesting because it's not just using uh, or generating a, a simple univariate association network or, or co-occurrence network um, or correlation network, if you will. But it has a, um, a very interesting additional step, which will try to, uh, through conditional independent search, try to detect um, putative indirect association with, within this network, which may be caused by niche overlap or the association with a, a given abiotic parameter, and just and actually remove this association from the network. So we have a much, we end up with a much sparser graph than, uh, than the, the global uh, complete um, unit association network. And so that's very interesting. Um, in addition to that, since we had pole-to-pole um, -pole sampling, we were also able to um, uh, use, uh, to do stat statistical inference of, of niche uh, range for each of the OTU we had sampled. So we, uh, for a number, a selection of parameters, of abiotic parameters, we could detect, well, we, we could um, uh, predict the, the optimum temperature, for example, of, uh, of abundance, but also the minimum and maximum uh, temperature of abundance. Um, and, uh, and that's very useful, uh, as I will show you, to actually uh, mine this global network uh, of um, of plankton co-occurrences. Um, so this global ocean plankton um, community network or interactome, as we call it, to make it short, uh, looks like that. So we integrated all the station I showed you previously. Uh, the great thing here is that we had uh, now integrated Arctic, uh, well, all the polar samples, mainly Arctic samples, but we had also Antarctic samples, uh, but all these polar samples. 
and uh, a better way to uh, predict this network uh, because we had um, uh, detected uh, these uh, indirect association and removed them um, from the global network using this probabilistic learning approach or conditional search independence uh, approach uh, I mentioned before. So that's the network. And uh, when you actually project this, um, the temperature range uh, or temperature, uh, optimum temperature uh, value or abundance value on that network, you, you directly realize that there is a very strong structuration um, by the temperature of this uh, predicted association from pole to pole. Um, and you, you directly see also that uh, we have a, a polar specific um, um, part of this uh, global network, which is emerging, as well as a gradient from uh, uh, higher to lower temperature. So that's, that was very uh, interesting to see. It makes sense, in fact, huh, that we have this strong structuration by, by temperature, as temperature was shown previously to be the largest um, uh, factor driving community composition. So it makes sense also that we see as driving this uh, global uh, network of, uh, of association. Um, but it was nice and reassuring to see this. Um, since we had access to this global network, we were also very interested in, uh, well, further asking what other parameters are shaping uh, the structure of this network. So to do this, we actually uh, use a different approach than, uh, than what is usually done. Um, usually the abiotic factors are directly integrated into the reconstruction uh, of the network and they are integrated as a, as a, a node, as a, a species node in the network. Uh, here what we, the approach we took was to actually extract local um, uh, sub-networks or networks from, from, from this global network, so networks specific to each uh, sampling site, so thus representing the the potential of uh, an interaction in each station. And we could um, then compute the political metrics for each of these, um, of these local networks that we then associated to each abiotic factors we had sampled uh, within Tara Ocean. And that's, what, uh, that's the result here. Where, when we uh, correlate, associate these uh, parameters to the, the topology of these networks, we again see that temperature uh, is a strong, uh, is strongly associated to, to the topology, to the structure of the network, but also salinity, oxygen, chlorophyll, nutrients, uh, pH, and light. So usually suspect in a way, um, but this is uh, showing that <clears throat> overall, it's not just temperature that is uh, shaping the, the global structure of the network, but it's also uh, salinity, which is often um, uh, neglected, neglected in a way. Uh, or not detected as an important factor, um, at, at least recently, but it seems to be the case for um, uh, influencing the structure of the, of the global network. Uh, light, of course, nutrients, uh, and pH. <clears throat> and here, a very surprising result was actually the fact that overall we had a um, uh, similar um, degree uh, uh, across this uh, 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 community uh, or biome specific networks, uh, but we are very different. Um, uh, we detected a much higher association strength and also much higher connectivity for the polar networks. That's what you see here. Um, this polar network uh, really stands um, apart and it's much more uh, connected and has also much higher weight uh, in, uh, associated to these edges. So that was very surprising because there's also lower diversity here, so uh, we, did, we really didn't expect that, and we, we can't quite explain it yet. Uh, we are look, we're working at trying to explain that, but maybe one explanation would be that uh, you have shorter uh, trophic, um, trophic uh, connections, trophic, uh, shorter um, uh, trophic uh, path length. In, uh, in, the, in the polar, so that may explain this higher connectivity, but uh, uh, that's an interesting result. In, uh, and we are, we are looking more into that now. Um, as I showed you, we, 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 we do detect the differences between, um, uh, we expect to find differences between um, uh, biomes uh, within this network, 
So what we wanted to do next is to try to um, uh, detect uh, uh, in a non-supervised fashion uh, the communities that uh, uh, could emerge from this global network. So to do this, we, we simply apply the community uh, detection algorithm uh, to detect um, uh, communities in this global network. And uh, what uh, emerged from this uh, clustering algorithm is the detection of five distinct communities. Uh, they are depicted here, in fact. Um, um, and we had detected two trade communities, or as we call them, trade likes communities. So these are tropical communities which are enriched uh, in um, uh, lower latitudes, uh, in abundance, they are enriched in lower latitudes, you see them here. So the, the members of these communities are enriched in, um, in lower latitudes. Uh, we also detected a westerlies-like community where members are enriched in abundance in, um, in uh, temperate uh, latitudes, so these are more uh, nutrient-rich waters, in fact. And we also had a clear polar-like uh, polar uh, community, which is depicted here in blue. What was interesting also is that we had one, uh, what we call one ubiquitous community, because all the members of this community were actually um, relatively well represented across all the, the, the sample station. Um, and what was also interesting is that we had uh, an enriched number of um, uh, bacteria in this ubiquitous community, showing that while well, bacteria seems to be very important um, in these association at global scale. They are not, um, they're globally uh, connecting, in fact, all the, the, all the other associations that are more uh, region specific or biome specific. So this is uh, just showing again the same uh, as I showed you. Uh, we have distinct communities, uh, four, uh, five distinct communities. Four of them are really different in terms of their association between taxa. Um, uh, that's what you, you see here. So uh, specific uh, taxa association are reported, uh, well, are detected in each of these communities. So they have very distinct local uh, interactomes. Uh, and that's just another representation of these. Uh, we could also detect very well enriched association within each of these communities. So what you see here is the is basically um, um, a, summar, um, a summarized network, global network, uh, and uh, on, on, on which we projected enriched association um, in each of these community we detected. So you see that uh, for the ubiquitous community, we have enriched association between um, specific groups of uh, prokaryotes, uh, but also between uh, aptophytes, inofese, and mal. And, in uh, other communities, you have distinct um, enriched association. So you have really specific association uh, enriched in each, each of these communities. Uh, and this um, made us uh, think that, well, since we have uh, so many, well, so different communities uh, along this latitudinal um, axis, uh, we, it made us think that probably these different communities will maybe differently affected by uh, environmental changes. And uh, we wanted to test this uh, hypothesis. And, uh, and that's why we uh, designed um, um, a computational simulation, in fact, to, to tackle this question. Um, what we did here was uh, trying to, to simulate uh, environmental changes by actually attacking this global network. So what I mean by attacking is progressively removing nodes uh, in this network to simulate um, uh, species uh, extension, in fact, or disappearance. <clears throat> so we did that, uh, progressively removing uh, species from this network, uh, ordered by the, actually the width of their uh, en environmental uh, niche uh, width uh, for distinct parameters to try to progressively remove the most, um, well, first the specialist species that have a narrow temperature range, for example, and so on and so on for uh, uh, the, the well, selection of abiotic parameters. And while doing that, we also assess uh, the robustness or the stability of, 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 the, of our network using two different metrics, the natural connectivity metrics and the Rundix index. Uh, which are well, topological index that uh, are good proxies to, to measure the robustness, the stability of the network. 
<clears throat> so we did that uh, for a selection of parameter, temperature, salinity, phosphate, nitrate, pH. Uh, we first conducted a, a global scale um, uh, simulation, uh, attack simulation. Uh, and what's interesting is that, that at global scale, we don't see um, a significant perturbation uh, of the, the global network. So we have a global robustness of the network. When we compare it as uh, an attack by the degree of the node, so that that's basically this degree attack is basically the most severe attack you can um, uh, you can do on the network. So we have a relatively um, global robustness that is detected here at a global scale. But now if you start to um, look at the effect uh, at the local effect or regional effect, the biome specific effect in fact of this uh, simulation of these attacks, you start to see things. You see that for example in the, the, the tropical communities, the trades like community, we have we, we can detect uh, a significant vulnerability uh, when you attack, uh, when you have uh, changes uh, in temperature and salinity, so that's what we detect here. We have we are below the random attack, so we have a significant uh, vulnerability in, in uh, when uh, temperature and salinity changes occur. Uh, and this is different than what we observe at the um, for the westerly like communities, so the temperate like communities. Here we have um, another type of vulnerability which is linked to not temperature nor salinity, but uh, the, the concentration of the nutrients of phosphate and um, nitrate. So this community is dif differentially uh, vulnerable or sensitive to, uh, to, to the change of these abiotic factors we consider. And when, we, when you look at the polar community, uh, again, which is a very strong effect of the temperature changes, even stronger than for, than for um, uh, um, tropical trades communities, you see that the, the temperature attack is even stronger than the, the attack by the, by the degree of the node. So it's a, it's a very strong signal here. So that's interesting because we, we can show uh, using this approach that we have differential, differential vulnerabilities uh, to environmental change for these distinct communities. Uh, and um, we can even go beyond and actually start to identify, delineate um, specific taxa that uh, are predicted to be the most uh, impacted um, by these changes in each of these community. And when we consider the, the polar uh, community and which will be, which is predicted to be most impacted by temperature change, we are able to uh, put forward several um, um, abundant uh, diatom genera and copepods genera, uh, among others, Keotoceros, uh, Porosira, uh, uh, and some copepods also, Pseudocanalus, and other from other genera, or other genera from this, from a family of copepods. Uh, and that's significant because uh, we know well that these type of organisms, items, copepods, contributes um, uh, very much to primary reproduction in these regions. And so these, uh, these taxa may also be good um, uh, species, uh, future species indicators to follow uh, ecosystem change, um, eventually in response to, to ocean warming. Okay, uh, I'm gonna finish here, but I just wanted to mention that we are very much trying to go beyond this and trying to, to, to understand, uh, not only trying to predict this association, but trying to explain them. And today we are fortunate to have access to a lot of, of I mean, big resources of um, uh, genome reconstructed from the environment, from, from these metagenomes in Sarah. Uh, so that's the work of Marina and Nils, and they are trying to, to make sense of, um, uh, of this association using genome resolved metagenomics, basically. Okay, and with that, I would like to thank a number of people, of course, all the, the combi team, uh, all the funding institutions, and all the partners, uh, and all the Tara Oceans family. It's a very big family, so I cannot uh, mention everyone here, but uh, um, it's always a, a great pleasure to work with all these people. And um, just to finish, I uh, would like to say that uh, we are always looking for great uh, people to work with us in Nantes, uh, in France. It's a very nice city, actually, very uh, dynamic city close to the Atlantic Ocean. 
So if you're interested to work with us, don't hesitate to contact us. And uh, well, thanks a lot for your attention. And I'm happy to take questions if you have any. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rebecca Vega Thurber. Dr. Thurber is the Pernod Distinguished Professor of Microbiology at Oregon State University. She graduated from UC Santa Cruz in 1999, degrees in marine biology and molecular biology. She received her PhD from Stanford University in biological sciences in 2005 before conducting an NSF minority postdoctoral fellowship at San Diego State University with Dr. Forrest Rauer. Her lab investigates the role and dynamics of bacteria and viruses in marine hosts and habitats in order to better understand and mitigate or prevent the proximate causes of marine disease, habitat degradation, and ecosystem alteration. Dr. Vega Thurber is committed to communicating science to broad audiences, including the production of a multilingual cartoon series and a full-length documentary on coral reef decline entitled Saving Atlantis. Today, she'll be talking with us about a microbiological and viral view of the causes and consequences of coral reef decline. Hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca Vega, and I want to thank everyone for inviting me today to speak at this webinar for M Systems and ASN. Today, I'm hoping to tell you two different stories about the role of microbes and viruses in coral reef health and convince you that bacteria and viruses are important not only for the biology and ecology of these threatened ecosystems, but also about the long term conservation of these threatened habitats. So before I begin, I want to thank the people who did the work. Today, I'm talking to you about some bacterial parasites, and that work was done by Dr. Lydia Baker, Dr. Julia Grace Klingis, and Dr. Rebecca Maher in collaboration with my uh, long-term partner, Aaron Mueller at Mount Marine Lab. And for the viral work where we're going to talk about single-stranded RNA viruses and corals, that work was led by Dr. Kalia Bastolis, a postdoc in my lab, in collaboration with my old postdoc and now collaborator, uh, Adrian Cray at Rice University. Um, the funding here came from the National Science Foundation and the Tar Oceans Program. So coral reefs are an ecosystem that exemplify the role of symbiosis. Coral reefs exist in habitats that are really low nutrient environments. So essentially they're deserts in the ocean. But although they are deserts, they have high biodiversity, high biomass. And this is really the result of the symbiotic relationship between animals and photosynthetic protists. So this is an example of a coral polyp. Corals are made are animals made up of many of these polyps. And inside you can see these algal protosymbionts in the family Symbiodinaceae. So essentially corals are mixotrophs. They provide this limiting nutrition in form of nitrogenous waste to these algal symbionts and they conduct primary productivity through photosynthesis, providing back this carbon rich compounds and amino acids so that the system can constantly recycle these nutrients. So essentially they're the engines of coral reefs. But on top of that notorious and famous symbiosis, there's also a large number of bacterial cells that are associated with coral. So here's a schematic of what a coral polyp is looking like in cross section. Cnidarians, which were a corals are members of, have only two tissue layers, a gastrodermal layer and um, a ectodermal layer. And within those ectodermal layers um, and gastrodermal layers are not only the symbionts as shown in this histology slide, these large um, pink cells are the algal symbionts, but they also contain these very large inclusions of bacteria, sometimes referred to as CAMAs or coral associated microbial associates. And that's what I'm going to be talking about in the first half of this um, presentation. Also, bacteria also found commonly on the surface mucus layer, and this is sometimes referred to as a, a similar analogous system to the gut mucosal layer, where bacteria are protective and stimulate the immune system of the corals. Now, many labs study the coral microbiome, but we are one of the few labs across the world that study also the viral composition of corals, and we do so using a combination of transmission electron microscopy and metagenomics and metatranscriptomics. So we and others have characterized the surface microbial community layers of viruses, and most of these are phages that infect the bacterial portion of the microbiome. But within the ectoderm and gastroderm, we have a collection of different viral types, those that infect animal cells, and those which we think infect symbiodinase, the algal symbiont of corals. And today I'm really going to work, uh, I'm going to talk to you about the single-stranded RNA viruses that we previously showed infect the algal symbiont. So in summary today, I'm going to talk to you about two different very stories, one about bacteria and the bacterial parasites of corals, and then I'm going to talk about viruses, 
and the viruses that infect corals and what they might have implications in turn the long-term evolutionary symbiosis between these algal symbionts and corals. So first I'm gonna take a big step back and talk to you about the discovery of a group of bacterial parasites that we have shown have very important co uh, conservation implications. So back in the early uh, 2000s or so, we conducted two long-term experiments and on reefs in South Florida. And what we did was because we know that nutrients are very important in coral reefs, yet they're very limiting, we wanted to look at experiments about that nutritional regulation. Now, because coastal systems are heavily influenced by humans, we also know that there's a lot of wastewater and fertilizers that run off into the ocean, and this could upset the balance of coral reefs. And so we do these experiments where we expose corals as shown here to a long release fertilizer called Osmocote to mimic nutrient pollution in coastal regions. And so there are two experiments, one where we looked at three different coral species over three years after this, during this exposure, and another one we exposed this coral, which is what I'm gonna primarily talk about in this talk, Acropora cervicones, and it was exposed to this compound for eight weeks. So just remember that this increases the abundance of nitrogen phosphorus species in the coral, in the coral reef water. So what we found was that in this uh, one experiment, both experiments showed the same thing, but I'm only showing this one um, from this paper from Shaver et al. done by my graduate student, Ryan McMines, we found that a single bacterial OTU went from a very low relative abundance in coral microbiomes to a very large abundance after nutrient enrichment. And this bacterial OTU was in the Rickettsiales family, and it has been previously found in corals associated with Caribbean reefs. My old advisor, Forrest Rauer, and, and his community had found this bacteria before, and they exist in these large inclusions. And so what we found was that after enrichment, these inclusions got very, very large. You can see them here in purple gymsustain. This is the coral polyp, the mouth here, and you can find the purple ones both in um, the mouth and the gastrodermal cells. But what Ryan also showed was, wasn't there only a tenfold increase in this bacteria, but its abundance was strongly correlated with coral growth, such that as if you had more of this Rickettsiales, the bacteria, the, the coral grew less, whereas when it did not have this bacteria, it grew its normal abundance. So here was a very strong smoking gun to us that this was an important bacteria in the health of these organisms. And I don't know about you, but I almost never see effect sizes like this in coral in any microbiology data. So we knew this was something we had to study. So what are Rickettsiales? Well, Rickettsiales are notorious members of uh, the alpha proteobacterial uh, group. They're the ancestor of the mitochondria. They are uh, very well known. The most famous are the Wolbachia, these uh, common symbionts of arthropods and they cause diseases in humans and wildlife, including typhus and Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So we had some implications of what this might be doing from the literature. We know that these tend to be parasitic bacteria. And so what I had my new graduate student do was essentially from this study, I gave her this one sample up here where the bacterial community was represented by 88% of this single bacterial OTU. And I had her generate a metagenome assembled genome. So this work was done by my very talented uh, student, Grace Klingus, who's now at Moat Marine Lab. And she took this sample and she generated a metagenome assembled genome and found that like other Rickettsiales, it had a smaller genome. So it was likely obligately parasitic. It had a high coding density and about 1500 predicted genes. Um, she did comparative phylogenomics. And what I want you to get from this phylogeny here is that when she compared this genome and 16S sequence to other sequences in the database, that she found it formed its own clade associated with other previously undescribed bacteria from marine systems. So this is really a marine and aquatic system associated bacteria that seems to be its own genera. And so we named this uh, bacterium Catadatus aquarichetsia raueri in um, honor of my past postdoctoral advisor, Forrest Rauer, um, who discovered it at the genomic level the first time. And so this is what the genome looks like. So what do we know about this bacterium? Well, we know a lot about what it can't do. It has very few genes involved in amino acid uh, generation. In fact, it has almost no nitrogen metabolism genes at all. But what it can do is steal a lot of stuff. 
It can steal ATP using the TLC gene. It can import lots of amino acids from its uh, coral host, and it can sense the presence of extracellular nitrogen and phosphorus using a, a combination of different um, two component systems like FORB and NRTY, NRTX two component systems, which can, once nitrogen or phosphorus are detected, can cause changes in the transcriptional profile of these organisms and potentially change their physiology. So at the time we were doing this very large uh, phylogeography experiment where we were looking at the microbial composition of corals across the planet in a phylogenetic context. And so what we did was we had collected corals from all over the world um, with uh, at different genera. So we could disentangle environment by host interactions. And so Grace compared her sequences to all of these data sets and found that this bacteria was very abundant and ubiquitous in corals across planet Earth. And so that really told us that this is a common uh, parasite of corals, but we weren't exactly sure what it was doing. So then my new postdoc, Dr. Lydia Baker, in collaboration with Aaron Mueller, we got a grant to look at the phylogenomics of this organism, and particularly in regards to the Caribbean corals where we had found it. Now, the Caribbean corals are the particularly threatened ones. These exist on the uh, IUNC red list. They are all critically endangered. And so we wanted to know what the role of this bacteria was in the evolution and health of these corals. So Dr. Baker, she took uh, samples from all over the Caribbean, full genome sequenced data sets, and compared uh, the bacterial composition and bacterial uh, aquariketsia Raura genomes across these three species. The fused staghorn is a hybrid of these two species here. And so what she did, she constructed 13 mags from all those locations. She never was able to create a mag from the curacao samples, but regardless, she was able to then do comparative phylogenomics and found that instead of uh, this bacterium having relationships specifically with hosts, that its genome components suggested that the population levels were focused on site and not host, because here you can see that the different colors are separating. So the bacterial populations of Aquariketsia were more distinct in Florida compared to the USVI compared to Belize. She also looked at the genomic components of these different populations and found that while they all contain most of their genes in common, they are obligate symbionts, um, they did have some unique sets of genes that distinguish the different populations. So for example, the Acropora um, in uh, Florida had a unique set of eight orthologous groups of genes, while the Belize had many more and the USVI only three. Now, what I'm not showing you is that we also did some evolutionary studies that showed that the Florida populations have these genes tend to be going under positive selection, and many of these positively selected genes are also virulence genes. So we think the Florida population is increased in virulence, and so we're going to continue studying that particular population of these bacteria. When she compared the evolutionary rates of the bacteria in our corals, she found that compared to terrestrial associated uh, uh, rickettsiales, those that infect arthropods that cause human disease, she found that the aquarochetsia is evolving at a much higher rate than those terrestrial species. And she found that the Florida population is also, uh, its evolutionary rate is much higher than the other two populations. Again really warranting us to focus on this Florida population for understanding what's going on there. Okay, the other thing that she found was that there was no data that suggested that like our hypothesis, we assumed that these bacteria would be vertically inherited because they are parasitic and obligate symbionts, but we actually found no evidence for that at the genomic level. So then we did a crossing experiment where we crossed several um, types of Acropora cervicornis. We collected the gametes and then the early stages of ontogeny. And what we found was that there was no Acroacatsia present in these early stages, but we did have high abundances in the parents and in, uh, in corals that were outplanted one year later. So we know that they're picking it up from the environment, which is pretty upsetting because these corals are involved in major restoration projects. And if this bacterium is reducing their growth, that's a problem. So in summary for this section, we found this unique clade of bacteria. They're found in many corals. Um, and in fact, most non bilaterian animals in the ocean. They tend to increase in abundance during nutrient pollution. They're associated with reduced growth. And what I didn't have time to talk to you about, they're also associated with disease susceptibility such that if they contain more of these bacteria shown up here, they tend to die at higher frequencies due to disease. 
they seem the Florida population seems to be evolving quickly and they're horizontally transmitted. So clearly we're gonna now study these uh, aspects of transmission. All right, so that's our bacterial parasite story. So next I wanna talk about the viruses and what are the viruses doing? So, as I mentioned, corals have a collection of different viruses like all holobionts, and we've been characterizing these at the genomic level using transcriptomics and metagenomics. And the virus that I'm gonna to talk to you today about is a single-stranded RNA virus we found back in 2012. So back in 2012, we did a metatranscriptomic experiment where we characterized all of the transcripts from DNA viruses and all the genomes of the RNA viruses that we could find. And what we found is that there was a small number of highly similar sequences to a virus that infects free living dinoflagellates in our corals. And so these corals were exposed to stress and then we looked at the production of these viral sequences. So that was this paper. And then a couple of years later, another lab published the genome of this virus. And so this virus is here, here's its genome. And it's very similar to this dinoflagellate infecting virus, heterocapsula circular squama virus. Okay, so this is its genome. It's small, it's single-stranded RNA, only 5,000 bases in length. And another group thinks that they found uh, that what this virus looks like, very, very large numbers of this very small RNA virus. So that kind of set the stage for this next experiment. So we're associated with the Tara Oceans Project, where we've been collecting, helping collect samples across the Pacific to evaluate the viral composition of coral reefs and corals themselves. And this work is led by Dr. Kelly Vistolis and our collaborators, Dr. Adrian Correa and Alex Veglia. So to investigate viruses in corals, she took a very large approach using all the Tara Pacific samples. These are samples collected across uh, the Pacific, which contain both corals and water. And so in summary, she analyzed 269 corals um, uh, metatranscript, I'm sorry, metagenomes. Um, each of these genomes about 100 million reads in depth and the coral water associated with them. She also compared the oceans, Tara Oceans data set. And then those sequences that I talked about in the Caribbean, these are corroborate coral um, whole genome sequences. So in total, she looked at 624 libraries for the presence of viral signatures. And this is what she found. So this is a complicated graph, but I'll walk you through it. So this is the, the path that the Tara Pacific took across the Caribbean here. And we collected three types of corals, two sclerotinian corals and a hydrozoan. The hydrozoan is shown in red, this Malepora species, and the pink is the Pocillopora, it's a sclerotinian species. What we found is that there were virus signatures in these metagenomes to a single-stranded RNA virus, that same virus that we discovered and published on in 2012. And it was present primarily as shown in red here on the um, Eastern Pacific in these Malepra hydrozoan corals shown here. But it was there was also some present in the, the stony coral in pink. But you can see that there's a regional distribution of it. What we also found was that we never found these single-stranded RNA virus sequences in water. And then because we were pretty sure that this virus infects the algal symbiont, she characterized all of the different viral, um, sorry, the, the different uh, symbiodinaceae genera that were present in these corals and found that the two different host taxa had a different collection of symbiodinaceae. And this will come up to be important in a second. But she wasn't satisfied and she said, okay, we find them in metagenomes, but we're not really sure who these viruses might be infecting. So then she scanned a whole bunch of polished genomes from the algal symbiont shown here in the greens and from different cnidarian hosts here shown in red. And what you can see is from the metagenomes, we find primarily these single-stranded RNA virus signatures in these hydrozoan corals. And in the polished genomes, the symbiodinium, this one genera of symbiodinaceae, um, had very large numbers of this single-stranded RNA virus in it. Um, but the, the coral genomes did not contain these viral signatures, verifying that this virus was associated with the algal symbiont of these holobionts and not the animal part. Okay, as we looked at more polished genomes, we realized that these signatures were found across the clade of symbiodinaceae as shown here. So symbiodinium is the oldest clade and we found a large number of sequences to this virus in the symbiodinaceae also in Durasdinium, Breviolium, Fugacium, and Cladicopium. We did not find it in these two, but we think that this is a false negative due to uh, the presence of, uh, of, because of poorly annotated genomes. All right, 
I got to get moving. Okay, so you might be asking yourself, what is going on here? Why are there single stranded RNA viruses in metagenomes? And that's a really important question. And immediately Cal knew why. And that's because these are slightly different than the active viruses. These are endogenized viruses. So if you look at this tree here, here's the viral genome, but the sequences that we found in the genomes and, and in the metagenomes are distinct in their sequences. And so we know that there are lots of endogenized viruses in genomes of all organisms, but they're primarily retroviral in origin. And this is a group, the different retro transposons that are present in eukaryotic genomes. So this is unusual because this is a single stranded RNA viruses, and it's assumed that these kinds of non-retroviral endogenous viral elements are rare, but we don't think so now. And we know that they tend to be placed inside genomes based on um, other retroviral elements or some sort of genetic component of the host. And so then Cal and Alex scanned a chromosome level uh, genome of these hosts. This is the Symbioninium microadriaticum and found that all of the uh, examples of our virus sequence, this is the RNA dependent RNA polymerase are flanked by retrotransposon like elements, including reverse transcriptase shown here and reverse transcriptase and retrotransposon here. So we're pretty sure these were endogenized through the activity of an already present um, retroviral element. So what does that mean? So I'm gonna sum up here. So the important thing is that this, we, to our knowledge, this is the first time a single-stranded RNA virus has been found in a eukaryotic genome at such high levels. Because it's present in the whole clade, we believe it was both ancestral and because it's so frequently found, we also think that this is a reoccurring event that these viral sequences are placed into the genome, but we don't know why. And so we really want to understand what is the role of these viruses. And it's thought that viruses sequences that maintain in genomes have been exapted for other functions, such as host immunity. And so we're following up now to see if these viral elements are involved in some sort of memory against active infection. And that's where I'll end you today. So. Thank you for um, listening, and I look forward to the questions in the latter half of the um, webinar. Well, I guess that uh, that's it from the presentations, <laughs> and uh, we can now start our um, panel discussion. So I I am uh, monitoring the question and answer, and also if uh, anyone from the audience, from the attendees, have any questions who who might want to ask. Um, otherwise, I have some a few questions on my own, but I, I would like to give the opportunity to to you guys to ask questions if you have any. Let's see. <laughs> Um, well, I see Jeff has his hand up, so yeah, why don't you start? <laughs> yeah, thank you. A uh, question for Samuel. So you described your networks as interaction networks or interactomes, and I'm, I was wondering if you feel that there is sufficient support for interactions between these taxa to characterize them as interactomes versus concurrent networks. We definitely don't have enough uh, support to say they are true interactions. That's correct. Uh, so the word interactome is um, how to say in English. In French, we would say abus de langage. <laughs> so yeah, it's just, let's say, one uh, short way to, to describe uh, a community association network or co-occurrence network. Uh, we had discussed this. Um, we, we, we decided to use the, the term as it is sometimes done in uh, protein um, interaction, um, in the protein interaction field. Uh, but yeah, I think you, it's important to point out that it's, uh, they may be, they are putative interaction. They are not, uh, we don't have enough support to say they are true interactions. That's for sure, yeah. <laughs> have you but tried actually? actually yeah, a, a, follow, a follow up on that. If you have enough um, temporal data, I, I don't know if this is the case for this data set, but um, I guess that, I mean, obviously it's not as good as, as actually observing the interaction, but if, if you try some sort of um, uh, Lord Cavalterra interaction type of model to infer the interactions, that might be 
yeah, like a better way of, uh, or, or a way of trying to argue for a more interaction type rather than concurrence type um, sort of links, right? Yeah, that's correct. I think this type of modeling, uh, dynamic modeling, or uh, if longitudinal data is available, I think that uh, these are ways to maybe not decipher true interaction, but at least to give um, a direction to these interactions. Because now what I described is an um, undirected graph, right? So we, we, we don't even, we don't have directed edges. Uh, but I think longitudinal data uh, can help to, to try to try to, to give a direction directionality to these uh, to these edges and and that may be very useful to um, maybe to try to extract information about ecological succession eventually. Um, but I think for to decipher true interaction, uh, I think experiments are needed. You need to go back to the lab uh, and test them uh, experimentally. I think that's uh, that's what we need to yeah. do. Good, good uh, luck yeah. with that. <laughs> I'll, I'll support that. Um, and and I guess one one of the problems is that the with with those sorts of data that are collected is that the the environment's always changing, and so when two things go up together, you don't know whether it's because they're supporting each other or because they're both being favored by the same environmental conditions. Yeah, it's. I think it's a little bit different from. Some of these other studies I've seen, which are under more controlled conditions, where perhaps then you can say, okay, the environment's stable and this thing's going up and this thing's going down. So probably that's because one's having a negative impact on the other one. Uh, I, th I, th I think for you know for marine surveys, unavoidably, there's just no way of enclosing a little patch of marine environment without changing the conditions. Um, and uh, so, so, so microcosm experiments are less satisfying. So you need to do these, these big say, scale controls, but then there's no way of holding the environment constant. Yeah, agreed. It's very challenging. I think there are ways to try to, uh, well, there are ways to try to uh, remove this or remove this indirect association uh, that may be due to uh well cooperation with abiotic factors but it's uh, it's always very tricky i think it's uh, you never it's very difficult to get away to get uh, them away completely i would say yeah but so what i uh, so i didn't describe that during the presentation but i think uh starting from genomes uh and uh we we can also start to and looking at the, the function of these genomes quite uh, co-associated genomes, we can start to um, uh, refine maybe this type of association network, try to understand uh, or detect some uh, uh, potential complementarity at the metabolic level, for example. So I think that's uh, an interesting direction to, to try to, um, well, to try to, to get better networks, basically, or more representative network uh, for uh, real interactions. Uh, Yeah, yeah, I think that that's a a promising way of doing it. Cool. Anyway, it's true that the, so the, there are it's just a, I mean these coherence networks, association network, are, are, are nonetheless a very useful way to um, to summarize the complexity of the of one uh, mi microbial community, and 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 useful information can be extracted from these networks, even though you have true uh, well false uh, positive in, in these networks, always. False positive association. I think at the beginning, uh, there was some uh, attendee uh, raising his hand. So I don't know if someone wanted to ask a question or not. But... Um, I don't know, but I see a question here for Rebecca uh, from Tulani. Um, he's asking, well, he's saying that his, uh, he found the work on, uh, on the effects of viruses on their hosts very interesting. And uh, on a systems level, how do you technically differentiate viral metabolic genes from those of eukaryotes or prokaryotes? That, that's a great question, Delani. I think that's probably our biggest challenge in the viral metagenomic and metatranscriptomic work is that in some cases, 
different groups of viruses, particularly small RNA viruses, do not tend to carry host genes. But the larger viruses, uh, particularly the nucleocytoplasmic large DNA viruses, which have very long genomes and incorporate genes from their hosts, it's very difficult at an um, informatic level to distinguish those genes from host. There are ways to do that in a phylogenetic context if you have the host genes already well described and you see changes at the protein or the nucleotide level. Um, and so you can create phylogenetic trees like we did showing that they're distinct um, clades of those sequences that would differentiate them from their host gene so that maybe they acquired the gene in the past and it's differentiated enough that it would fall out in a different clade. Um, we tend to be very conservative in my lab for doing this. So we only use for our phylogenetic trees viral specific genes. So that's why we use the RNA dependent RNA polymerase for all of our genes, because those are only exclusively found in the virus itself and never in hosts or something like a major capsid protein. Um, but when you're doing metatranscriptomics, you're looking for all genes that might have some viral signature. Um, and so we tend to bin those and then curate them at a very fine level to make sure that they don't contain host-like signatures. But then we might also have those false negatives, right? So that perhaps the, what we threw away was really viral in nature, but we tend to just stick with the very sure um, annotations. Um, but it is, it's, a, it's a big, tricky issue in viral ecology. Is it, I, I, I don't know anything about this, but is it uh, common for like pieces of the virus DNA, uh, DNA to be RNA, sorry, to be like adopted by the host or? Yeah, so, so um, if you look at the human genome, about 8% of the human genome is retroviral or some viral um, ancestral sequence because particularly for retroviruses, which, which can have a DNA stage, they can incorporate into the genome also things like adenoviruses, other types of viruses that endogenize or put their genome inside the host. Those can be maintained, especially if it's in the germline, for example, in, in um, a multicellular organisms, and those can be maintained. Um, for single cell organisms like protists, the endogenization of a virus is highly heritable. So protists in particular carry endogenized viruses throughout their lineages, because once they get in, they're passed indefinitely unless they're degraded over evolutionary time. And so the, the reason we were surprised by this is because one, retroviruses do this all the time, but single-stranded RNA viruses don't have a mechanism to do this. So they must have been captured in a different mechanism than retroviral endogenization. And so that's why we think this is so particularly interesting. And it's so common in this lineage. You know, we find thousands of examples across the chromosomes and across the different uh, the clades, which, which represent about 200 million years of evolution. And so they're being kept, we believe, for some reason. And that's why we think that maybe they're involved in some sort of RNAi long-term memory against active viruses, because if they can present short sequence, they do contain dicer and RNAi-like uh, molecular mechanisms. So perhaps these sequences are transcribed and that can provide a memory to those protists against um, active virus infection. That's what we think is going on. So yes, so a long, long answer to yes, this happens frequently, but particularly for other kinds of viruses, not these kinds. Very interesting. <laughs> cool. Um... So I have uh, another question here. This one is for Tom. Um, uh, Tulani was wondering if you could um, like elaborate a little bit more on the on the bottom up approach you were talking about, specifically um, whether such studies would be hard to reproduce in situ given the shifts in microbial communities. Um, yeah, good. Good, good question. I, I mean, I think the all, all I was trying to get at is that for for my whole career, the way I've been doing this kind of science is we kind of come up with hypotheses and then we test those hypotheses and we have very statistical tests for you know seeing whether or not we have a grasp of these systems. Um, so this this was a little bit of a revelation to me that could be done a little bit differently. Um, 
and it's it's all about starting with the the communities and using the patterns we observe in those communities to generate those hypotheses so it is the case that if communities are very variable over time then perhaps that temporal access access is the most important factor in determining what the composition is but in that case when we collect lots of communities the major clustering should be around the time point at which you collected those communities um, and 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 that's something that should emerge from you know the sorts of patterns that we've been talking about from the association networks from the um, you know or, ordinations and, and and so forth um so it's i mean it's it's similar it's similar to looking for these um um you know um just uh, w w whether there are classes categories of communities that we can find in these in these environments or whether it's a some something that's a little bit of a you know a, a gradient from one environment to the next if we do you know earth microbiome kinds of things and just collect things from all over the world then what are the major axes can we um with, without knowing that something was collected from a terrestrial environment can we tell that it's terrestrial and how much refinement can we put uh, how much can we refine that approach can we can we say what year it was collected from was it you know uh, what what kind of soil it was from and so forth um, and i think that that could make much greater strides rather than doing it piecemeal and you know testing one hypothesis at a time if we first know what the axes are what the major communities are in terms of how they differ and then ask the questions about why it is that they differ. But of course, we come back to hypothesis testing at the end of it. Of course we do. We need, you know, that's how we do science for the most part. But that is a way of then refining the kinds of hypotheses that we're testing. Cool. Yeah, I actually wanted to ask you something uh, not, not as interesting as this last question, but I am, uh... Uh, well, as you, as you know, I have done some stuff with like invasions in networks and, you know, with, with other communities, with, within communities. And, uh, and I was wondering, um, maybe you did this, I, I, I didn't pick it up from, from the talk, but when you introduce in, in that uh, invasion community um, sort of experiment, did, did you have different traits for the species that you introduce? And the fact that that functional group four was like highly related to the invasiveness of of the community uh do you think that it has it, it could change if the traits of the invasive species are different uh yes so i i, I would think so um we we haven't gone too far down that trajectory we have i guess we could look at try to try to look at the genomes of what's in and group four and compare that to the genomes of the two invaders that we used and so forth. Um, uh, it's, uh, yeah, but we, we, we have, we haven't done that kind of thing. We haven't yet. We, we, it's just not something we've done. Um, I, th I think that that would be a, a nice approach. I'm, I'm not sure yet. So, so we have one confounding factor was that the, um, the communities that could grow the best in those environment were, were by far the ones that could exclude the invaders to the greatest degree. Um, and we do see some independent effects of having particular functional groups, but there's um, the invasion success is only partially mediated by the presence of these different functional groups. Most of the effect is driven by just uh, how well the community as a whole can grow under those environmental conditions. Yeah, that that makes sense. I, yeah, I, I think that uh, you know the species trait, you know, especially the invasive. Well, it it has been shown like in terrestrial communities, right? If you have like, if you are a good competitor with a particular other species in the recipient community, then yeah, yeah. yeah I think I mean one interesting question that I think is uh, would be open for debate is we have. You know, we talk about dispersal of microbial cells. They're they're floating around everywhere. We carry them around with us on the bottom of our shoes and things like that. So there's there's 
cells just floating in and coming into a, an environment, um, what proportion of those cells survive and what proportion of those that survive are actually able to colonize those habitats, I think is, is something that's completely unknown and uh, could potentially be very important for, for the dynamics of some of these communities. Particularly, I mean, the, the, the cases where it is known is the cases where we really um, uh, uh, notice that they're having an impact. So things like plant pathogens and so forth, you can see them circulating around the country, around Europe or somewhere like that. We can pick that up very quickly. So clearly these kinds of dispersal dynamics are important, but just for regular environmental microbes that aren't pathogens or anything like that, how how often do you get a cell that comes in and is able to establish and and what sort what are the characteristics of the communities that prevent or allow those cells from getting in i think it's a completely open question yeah so we have a question from the audience which rebecca sort of uh, already um, you know started giving an answer to on the chat but if you guys have uh, any other sort of uh, ideas or thoughts on that. Um, so Abdul is asking, why isn't there enough work phage viruses on amoeba in rivers, uh, which is engulfed by a kind of worms and uh, that can be used as a medicinal weapon against different bacteria and viruses? Um, and he's wondering whether you guys could share an idea on that. So I, I commented that I, th I think the question is about can we use viruses and phage to control um, disease causing organisms in the environment and that is definitely being done and, and since you know the early 1900s the Russians have used phage therapy uh, against human diseases particularly in uh, their military against gangrenous limbs and things like that to fight infection. And in the last 20 years, the United States and many other countries have been using phage therapy in the food industry to regulate things like listeria outbreaks and uh, different types of, of, of um, processed foods. Um, in terms of amoeba, there are these amazing viruses of amoeba that exist and can kill these outbreaks. But in terms of, of using those particular eukaryotic viruses for disease regulation, I haven't I, I personally haven't seen anything like that, but it's an interesting idea, particularly in areas where um, amoebic dysentery is, is a real problem. But it's a, it's a very exciting area of work, I think, this applied approach of using viruses to control disease. Cool, thanks. Um, I think that we are, I mean, I have a few more questions I wanted to ask, but I think that we are running out of time. Is that correct, Koa? Um, so, okay, well, it seems like, like we have some more time. Um, I was, uh, actually wondering when you, oh, one more question. Okay. Since, since there are no more on the pipeline I, on the QI, I'm, I'm going to ask one more. <laughs> um, I, I, I was interested, uh, Rebecca in, in the stuff that you were saying about, um, uh, you know, that virus being not transmitted vertically, which is which was surprising to you and also me. <laughs> you mean the bacteria? Uh, the, bacteria. Uh, the bacteria, sorry. So I was wondering um, how, uh, I mean, did, did you did you go out and look in the water surrounding the either the larvae when they settle or maybe the substrate to see how common this bacteria is so how likely it is because yeah right now we are doing some some work on on the like the microbial cues for larval settlement in corals and uh and i was just wondering whether maybe the larvae actually seeks for some fingerprints in the community that might include this and then at the point the time of settlement they take that bacteria or we don't no, see it. At, we don't. Yeah, we don't see it at settlement. So we didn't see it in zygotes. We didn't see it in planula larvae, which are settled. We didn't see it in metamorphs. We didn't see it until they were adults. So where they had, um, where they were out on the reef and adults. So we we do find this bacterium in sediment. We don't know. You know, sediment is composed of coral skeletons. So we don't know if that's like 
from old dead corals. We don't know if it's from interstitial organisms. We the rickettsia leaves are very commonly uh, associated with ciliates and other protists. So it could be that they're also in ciliates. Ciliates also eat corals. So it, maybe the transmission mechanism is some sort of predation. So if you have a snail or a ciliate that consumes these corals, it could potentially transfer it. In most other rickettsia leaf systems like typhus and Rocky Mountain spotted beaver, these are transmitted by other invertebrates like arthropods. And so it wouldn't be unreasonable to assume that that's also how it's transmitted in the ocean. So potentially there's a, a vector that transmits it. And so we've collected snails, ciliates, and other things and have found them present in those, but we haven't yet be able to disentangle the presence versus consumption versus transmission. You know, transmi proving transmission is very, very difficult. Um, compared to just, you know, okay, they ate it, now they have it in their guts, that doesn't mean they're transmitting it, right? So we're in the process of doing those experiments. That's very interesting. I didn't know that you could trans, well, uh, I guess that I could have guessed it, but transmitting bacteria via vector, yeah. <laughs> I always assume that they, you know, they just suck it up from the water because that's how, well, at least, yeah, I guess I have a biased vision of the world from the sponges, which is what I mostly do. So they keep uh, so filtering water. So, yeah, that is perfectly <laughs> viable option, too. I didn't show you we have a lot of transmission electron microscopy done on these. And remember, yeah. I said they form in these very large inclusions, these camas coral associated um, inclusions. And these happen to be also the mucocytes of the corals. And so mucocytes are generated to produce this um, extracellular mucus layer. And so it seems like these bacteria infiltrate that cell type potentially as a transmission mechanism because the corals will naturally spit those out into the environment. So it could be as simple as being in the presence of other corals that are releasing these um, uh, bacteria sites and then consuming them. But we haven't found evidence for that. That's a that's a harder test, I think. Yeah. <laughs> we have corals that have it and corals that don't have it. And we've put them next to each other. And the corals that don't have it don't take it up. Yeah. So we think it's more of an active process. So um, but again, that's like our big next, like all the transmission stuff is is our next, you know, goal to figure out that aspect of the system. Cool. So, well, thank you, thank you, the three of you again for, you know, being here and, and answering all of our questions. Now I, I am gonna wrap up the session and uh, for all of the attendees, if you guys want to uh, stay around a little bit and uh, have a chance to meet our speakers in a more, uh, you know, sort of one-to-one -one session, um, we are now posting in the chat a Zoom link for um, for a different Zoom session, which is not a, a webinar like this. Uh, so you can actually interact with the speakers. And uh, we are gonna be, so we are gonna be closing down this webinar. And if you guys are interested in, uh, as I said, meeting with the speakers, if you can, please go to that other Zoom session, then I uh, we will all meet you there, I guess, yeah. Cool. Thank you very much.